Hey, so uh, first of all, um, a lot of us aren't here right now, but um, most of us during this project were all MBA students and um, we had to do our capstone project, which was basically we uh, picked a project for, um, that we could really apply what we learned during our time in our MBA and um, the Rose Park Clinic was an amazing opportunity for us and we truly did learn a lot and it was, uh, it was, it was great to work with the people that worked with the Rose Park Clinic. Um, so first of all, our mission was to, um, I don't know, work with a innovative and sustainable model of care and try to find out ways to, um, improve the clinic and really kind of bring apart that mission, um, in providing an ex exceptional educational experience for students and making sure that there's quality, equitable, and affordable primary care for the Salt Lake City community. Um, the tasks that we kind of wanted to um, focus on was kind of threefold. We wanted to do a marketing portion, um, an operational portion, and a finance portion um, in which we kind of dived into the current insights of um, how is the, the Rose Park Clinic mar marketing itself? Like, is it getting um, patients? Is it, I don't know, what, what does it look like to the outside world? Um, we wanted to then dive into key focus areas and then make our recommendation. So for marketing, uh, like I said on the previous slide, we really just wanted to grow the patient panel. So really get the word out about the Rose Park Clinic. Uh, so kind of anecdotally, um, on our first meeting that we had as an MBA team in the Rose Park Clinic, we had a little bit of a hard time finding the clinic. We typed <laughs> into our phones. <laughs> Rose Park Clinic. Turns out there are two Rose Park Clinics, so half the team went to the wrong one. Um, and once we got to the right one, uh, we weren't sure exactly where to go. There were no signs on the outside of the building, no signs pointing us upstairs in the inside of the building. Um, so we took that into account when we looked at our, our marketing recommendations, what we wanted to do. Um, so we looked at kind of two different areas. One is the online presence and one is uh, sort of physical pamphlets uh, and, and spreading the word throughout the community. Um, so for an online presence, uh, social media is a great way to, to spread the word. So creating an Instagram page, X, formerly known as Twitter, um, Facebook, LinkedIn, any social media outlet, um, and then search engine optimization. And so that goes back to that, you know, searching on Google's Maps for the Rose Park Clinic. With search engine optimization, that'll uh, boost up the U of U Health Rose Park Clinic so that it's the first or at least near the top of the results. Um, and then Google Analytics is a way to... Uh, monitor the effectiveness of any social media campaigns, uh, search engine optimization, figure out how people are finding out about the U of U Health uh, Rose Park Clinic. Uh, so we looked at adding signage as well. And I believe since then, I mean, I think our first meeting was six or seven months ago. Since then, signage has been added uh, to the outside of the building. So it's, uh, it's a lot easier to find now. Uh, we're not getting lost quite as easily. Um, and with the printing marketing uh, pamphlets, so a lot of the population still has little or no access to the internet, um, so pamphlets are a, a key way to spread that. So building relationships also is another huge way to spread the word about the Rose Park Clinic. Um, so looked at building relationships with places like libraries, uh, transportation, so that could even just be bus stops. Um, schools, shelters, so the homeless population. Um, refugee centers is, is another huge avenue, another huge place um, the Rose Park Clinic can be reaching out to. So there's actually a refugee center right around the corner from the Rose Park Clinic. Um, and as of 2017, there were 60,000 refugees in Utah. Um, and that number has only been growing since. Uh, community centers is another place we looked at uh, just to spread pamphlets, spread awareness. A lot of families go to community centers, and there are a lot of community centers in the area that could benefit uh, greatly from having affordable health care and access to uh, a place like the Rose Park Clinic. Um, so as MBA students, we uh, during our educational experience, we were taught to maximize profits, maximize you know, sales and whatever. And, um, really, so when kind of coming into this project, we, we that's kind of the mentality we had. But quickly, we learned that um, rather than maximizing, um, we wanted to optimize, especially for the learning experience for the medical students and the clinic overall. Um, so we ended up focusing on three portions um, within the operations. We wanted to look at 
how the students are feeling with their educational experience with the Rose Park Clinic. Um, we want to look at patient outcomes, and then we wanted to dive into clinic flow. And we thought that really by really focusing on these three aspects, we can optimize um, the clinic overall. Perfect. So our first step in kind of our analysis of operations was to create a diagram that mapped out all the processes that happened at the clinic and who did those processes, how long it took. And as you can see, the medical student who's in the student provider role to the line. So uh, a lot of the processes that took the most time were with that student. And uh, we tried to focus on making sure that we didn't reduce the student's learning opportunity. So the part that takes the longest is the history and physical. And we kind of deemed that that was protected time because we didn't want to cut back on the student's time with patients. The other two areas, the assessment and plan are a great learning opportunity for students to kind of put their clinical knowledge to the test. And that takes up some time. And then the most fun part of healthcare documentation also took up a significant <laughs> amount of time. So those are the three areas that we identified as um, potential, potential spots for us to implement some places to improve the clinic flow. And we also got some feedback from a student survey, which Patrick's gonna talk about. And we tried to tailor our recommendations to meet those three areas as well. Um, so uh, upon um, our survey, so we we kind of wanted to see like, what, what do the students feel about um, the clinic overall? Um, and the first question we asked was, what is your current learning experience and how would you rate it? And they rated it an average of 2.5 out of five, which is, it. That's pretty good. It's a brand new clinic and like it, it's been doing exceptionally well. Um, but there are definitely areas that we found that the students thought needed improvement. Um, a few of those um, areas were students expressed the need for increased training in epic and clinical roles. Um, a lot of people got in there and they spent a lot of their time just like not knowing how to even navigate epic and what to do and what to do. Um, we saw that students express a desire to see more patients. The clinic flow was very low. Um, so some students are getting experience in other clinics and other students aren't. Um, and we think that by increasing marketing and other stuff like that, you can get there. Um, we also saw a feeling of a need for um, increased mentorship and clearly defined expectations. A lot of students thought they were going to get in here and learn how to diagnose and, and, and really get like a full dive in and um, their their first years, but they they thought they were going to do a lot more than they actually did. So kind of laying out like a list of expectations of what you're going to actually do during the clinic is we thought would be very important. Um, from there, the recommendations we kind of wanted to make were we thought it'd be nice to have a, a mock clinic during scope. Um, we think that, again, defining clear learning expectations for what your students are going to learn during your time there so they're not underwhelmed or overwhelmed. Um, and then having assigned the roles. Um, some students were go-getters and wanted when given an opportunity of like, who, hey, who wants to work with these patients? Then you had some kids that were always like, yes, me, me, I want to work with do this. And other kids that were maybe more reserved didn't get that. And they felt like they weren't getting as much experience as the other students. Um, we think that um, working with patient scheduling could be, is, would be super important. And also, like one of the one of the big recommendations we found were um, there's a, a desire for maybe a third or fourth year presence um, with within the clinic. Maybe the provider doesn't really have a whole lot of time to work individually with certain students, and maybe having a a mentor um, there to aid and maybe figuring out how to work out Epic and stuff like that. Um, but we think that that would be good, and we've heard that they're doing that by making a dedicated elective. Um, where those third or fourth years can work with the clinic and get those hours. So the last part of our project was to focus on the continu like the continuation of the financial viability of the clinic, what that will look like. We really live by um, funding from the medical school and and from other organizations, from governments, and we're so grateful for that. And we have to think about, you know, how do we, what is the best 
What is our best use of our time and resources that we've been given? How do we stretch those the farthest we possibly can? How do we be the best stewards we can over what we've been given? And ultimately try our best to be sustainable on our own. And can we make that happen? And asking those questions is, we believe essential for every clinic. That every clinic needs to be thinking about that, needs to be thinking about how can we continue to serve these communities in the event that becomes a lot harder to, in the event that the legislation changes and that we get less money. How, how do we, you know, everyone should be thinking about how can we do that for our patients? And one of the ways that we've thought about that, and this is a bit unique, um, talking about fee for service and value based care, because this is, typically talked about in the context of patients who have insurance, because these are contracts with insurance companies. And my personal opinion, what we've talked about as a team is that when we talk about value, we go forward one more. There we go with the full slide. When we talk about value, it's the transition to doing things, being reimbursed for things that have an impact on a longer time horizon. You stretch out your time horizon a little bit and you're reimbursed for taking care of people when they don't need really expensive care down the road. You're reimbursed better for that upfront in a lot of ways. It makes sense for a lot of systems to transition that way and clinics to transition that way. And some of you may be thinking, you know what, none of my patients are insured. This doesn't apply to me. I would say it does to really think about the needs of the patients. If you're really doing your best to serve them, you would think about how do I prevent them from incurring massive expenses down the road? Whether you're doing that for an insurance company or just because you care about your patients, it's the same thing. And the things you'll implement, the things you'll do to improve the systems that insurers like to see will actually be better for your patients too. And so from even a phil philosophical level, we thought, you know, this is, this is what we need to do for, to, to actually align the incentives to get patients better care from, from the beginning. So we can talk to we're blue in the face about how we how we build a patient panel for value-based care. The tables four and, and maybe five too, if you want to meander over there. We'll be talking a lot about that. But I we just wanted to give a couple of insights that we've derived from thinking about this problem and then more specifically to um, the, what the clinics might do in more of a practical way. There's been six proposed general steps to moving towards a value, a value-driven or value-based system or a value-based clinic. And that's first to align provider panels with at-risk patients, identifying the patients that need the most help, who, who maybe we don't right now know about, or we do, but they're not being seen enough. They're not being seeing the right people. They don't have enough touch points to actually get the help that they need. To restructure the teams and workflows around those patients, not expecting patients to come to us. We go find them. We engage in follow-up calls. We engage in things that perhaps we're not reimbursed for, but that we think are important for giving the best care to patients. Third, providers and teams have to work together to know about this, to know about how to think about this in a way that is a much longer time horizon on managing this person's A1C right now is incredibly important, but we also need to talk about um, what, they're, what they're doing when they're not here, when they're not getting their A1C drawn, that affects that, knowing that. We already do that, but systematizing that is essential for this. Novel technologies are important for this as well. If you need if patients need a fridge to store their insulin, you need to get them a fridge to store their insulin. And paying for that makes sense when we're operating in a value-based model. Real-time insights are also incredibly important because the more data we have, the better decisions we can make about these patients. And that's obviously essential as well. And then aligning incentives is the crux of the whole thing, making sure that um, patients that need um, the most care at any given time, we're actually the ones being seen in the clinic, and we prioritize that. And the incentives driving that are actually aligned with that patient panel. Um, you can just click through all of them. Thank you. So the things that we thought would be helpful in doing this, because those are those are fairly uh, nebulous concepts of like, okay, we love this idea of like do things better, make a good system. But the things that we can actually do as clinics, as student-led clinics that we can take ownership of is doing data collection and reporting systematically and really, really well. Getting all of the data we might need to identify these patients, making sure we know that, know those numbers, know what our payer mix looks like, know, know all of those things and dial down those metrics that we feel confident they're correct and that we can make data-driven decisions because of that. 
having a risk profile and impact study of our patient panel, knowing based on data from the university that we have access to and other databases, what are the factors influencing the likelihood of needed care in the future? And what can we, what disease pathologies can we stop on the front end and using data to actually make those decisions? Targeted marketing is also very, very important talking about actually not only do we identify those patients, but we actually convince them that they should come to us. Of course, community healthcare workers are essential in that, in that mission of helping patients who need to be in the clinic get to our clinic so we can see them and we can play a role in that as well. Transitions, transitions of care are obviously very important when a patient discharged from the hospital and they don't have a primary care doctor. There should be immediate follow-up, if not from another primary care clinic, to one of our student-led clinics. If they don't have somewhere else to go, it's often a great avenue for that, and they're often left without a, a lot of, without a lot of direction um, at that point in their care. Once this has been, um, once these four things have done, you can begin to negotiate with the different, both the payers that you interact with, and also government. Uh, entities who insure many of these patients and who have incentives um, to give a lot of money to clinics and to health systems that are able to take care of massive problems before they become those massive problems. And that's why we care so much about preventative and primary care. And that's why we're all here to actually do that for these patients. Six, uh, we mentioned future capstone teams because we think it's essential to be thinking about these things. Medical students are stretched very, very thin and incorporating a collaborative effort with the business school and uh, other schools as well. Bringing people together to think about these issues, I think will be um, incredibly fruitful as we think about how to do this in the very context of each of our clinics. Lastly, one of the concerns uh, that we talk about and think about is a revenue drop as you transition to a value-based model. And this is more, a little bit more in the weeds, but something we wanted to bring up because it is, it's a unique aspect of student-led clinics in general, that we have a workforce that is very, very effective. And that is uh, great at seeing patients that we don't happen to pay. Um, yeah. I mean, we could change that, but <laughs> medical students right now are not paid. <laughs> and uh, as we as we enter this period, it's we're uniquely a lot of the models that and projections that are run in these simulations are based on actually paying staff, and we don't do that in the same way a normal clinic would. And you have to consider that. You have to consider what that looks like, um, and how that how that impacts this period. Also, there's pre-funding contracts that we've talked about. You can mitigate losses uh, in transitioning to a value-based care system. Um, by making contracts specific with insurers to, to mitigate that risk of that drop. And then also, um, for Rose Park specifically, the number is 34% of Medicare and commercial commercially insured patients. So when you do this with Medicaid patients, um, it's much more reasonable to, to make this happen. And then, of course, again, our unique advantage is the students. We mentioned the touch points that are so important. And uh, the impact that students do make is incredible in these clinics. And uh, it goes without saying that it's, it's mutually beneficial um, but there really is a big difference being made in these patients' lives, and I think it's important to recognize, this, uh, recognize that as well. We have time for a couple of questions, if anybody has some for this group. Do you have any data on, on how um, the marketing efforts SEO, et cetera, that, uh, that your team did, uh, what effects those had on the patient panel, um, both in terms of size, as well as any demographic um, changes that have occurred. The question for those on Zoom was about data on um, the impact that the marketing has had on the patient panel at Rose Park. Um, so we actually gave these recommendations um, just about a month ago, a little over that. So we, we don't actually have any current up-to-date real-time data um, for the effectiveness, effectiveness of that. We have one more question. It's on the SEO, are you doing just English as the primary language? Question for the Zoom is whether or not English is the only language for the SEO. Um, the SEO, I mean, whatever the target market is, right? So I think English and Spanish are the two primary focuses here. Um, and these are things that, again, they, they're recommendations that we've made, and I, I'm not actually really up to date on the, the current status of if those recommendations have been fully implemented. 
Um, so that might be a better question for some of the student-led directors that they'll hopefully be implementing that. Thank you. Thank you guys for sharing your work. And it's been really cool to see it play out in real time at Rose Park.